Did you know that investors who bought First Republic Bank a year ago would have lost 86% of their money, even including dividends? All the volatility, market panic, investors buying and selling like crazy. The stock price chart of First Holy Republic Holy. Bank looked steeper than King the Ka. Yeah, I also had to look it up. It's the tallest and longest roller coaster in the world. Still, I don't think King the Ka will give you the same adrenaline as holding volatile stocks like First Republic Bank. A lot of people have lost money with this bank stock, and in hindsight, it is probably obvious that they should have avoided it. I know, a lot of things are obvious in hindsight, but looking at the quick collapse of First Republic Bank in hindsight can give us a lot of extremely valuable lessons. Specifically, there are three lessons that I want to point out here. The most obvious one in my opinion is this avoid investing in what you do not understand this is one of peter lynch's most famous advices peter lynch is an absolute national treasure when it comes to good investing advice and he recommends that when you invest you focus on the fields that you understand or even work in you may ask yourself why is that why should i only invest in fields that i understand it's simple let's take a look at first republic bank did you know that they were going to fail were you aware of the risk probably not most investors were not. This is precisely why everyone started panicking. Being able to assess the stability of the bank, their ability to make money, the balance sheet, how well they are managed, that's extremely hard. Obviously, you have experienced investors like Warren Buffett who know their stuff. They are in a much better position to analyze these banks. But for small individual investors like you and me, it can be very hard. Even Warren Buffett has said on numerous times that financial companies are a lot more difficult to analyze than the rest. In fact, sometimes the people who own and run the bank have a lot of issues analyzing it. The main thing that they need to worry about is whether the loans are any good, at least when it comes to commercial banks. I'm not talking about investment banks here. Assessing loan and credit risk, doing proper risk management is what the bank is all about. The problem here is that it is very hard to tell as an outside investor whether these procedures are done properly. Hard to tell if agencies are rating loans objectively. If you are familiar with the big short book and movie, you will know that there can be a lot of bias, conflict of interest and so on. Again, sometimes even the bankers themselves are not aware of the risks involved or simply ignore them. Then you also have the industry regulations, laws, anything of that nature that can massively change the landscape of an industry. It can boost it, it can shrink it, it can limit growth opportunities. Banking specifically is one of the most regulated industries as it should be, really. However, how much do you know about these regulations and how much time can you spend analyzing them plus any changes in how they impact the existing companies? What I'm trying to say here is that banks and probably other financial institutions like insurance companies, they can be very hard to assess. A lot of times investors buy stocks because they have a good dividend or a low valuation, but fail to do proper due diligence. They think they understand more than they actually do. They ignore red flags and stay overly optimistic. Don't do that. If there is one thing that we can take away from all this turmoil that Silicon Valley and First Republic Bank cost is this. Only invest in stocks that you really, truly understand. You know the business, you know when they struggle, you know when they can outperform. Am I saying that you should avoid bank stocks altogether? No, what I am saying is that you should really be putting a lot of time into researching and learning about the business. Typically, bigger businesses are also more solid, so that's also something to consider. Small stocks, especially penny stocks, can be extremely volatile and a lot more likely to lose you money than big established companies. This really brings me on to my second point, the second lesson, and that is managing your risk. By that, I mean manage your exposure. Specifically, manage how big a position is relative to your portfolio. If you had most of your money concentrated in one of the failing banks, you would have blown up your portfolio without being able to do much about it. When it comes to risk management in a portfolio, there are different approaches. The main one involves limiting your stock positions in your portfolio to a specific size. Some investors say a maximum position size of 5% relative to total assets is good. Others argue that 10%, even 15% can be healthy. It really depends on a few things, like your risk appetite, how well the economy is doing, what is the overarching market sentiment, what type of company are you investing in? For example, companies like Walmart, massive consumer staples companies with hundreds of billions in market capitalization, they can easily make up 15% of your portfolio, no problem. However, smaller, cyclical companies like Fluor Corporation, a construction company with a market cap of only 4 billion, are a lot more volatile. Again, we saw this recently with big banks like Citigroup and JP Morgan falling a lot less than smaller banks like First Republic, obviously, but also 
Citizens Financial Group, PNC and others. Plus, if the economy is struggling, then it is best to spread your risk further and limit your biggest positions to 5, 6, 7% instead of 10 or 15%. Another way of managing risk is diversification. That means buying different companies in different sectors, perhaps even different countries. The idea here is to invest in sectors which are not correlated, so that if one sector is struggling, then the other sectors can make up for it. Basically, avoid putting all of your money in tech or bank stocks and spread yourself out a bit more. It's also a good idea to consider different type of asset classes altogether, like bonds or gold. Some investors obviously disagree with that. Michael Burry thinks that if you buy a sufficiently undervalued company, it doesn't really matter what sector it is in, because the cheap valuation limits how much you can lose. However, that obviously requires you to do a lot of research and be extremely confident in that business. Then you have investors like Warren Buffett who say that if you know what you are doing, diversification doesn't really make sense. Three good businesses are all you need. That's what he says and I agree. But then again, you and I are not Warren Buffett and we are not Michael Burry. A better quote of Warren Buffett is that diversification is protection against stupidity. As individual investors, we need to realize that we are massively behind professional investors who live and breathe the markets. Imagine you spend 5 or 10 hours a week researching companies, learning about investing, reading about the economy and compare this to investment bankers and analysts who do this for 80 hours and more. They have the knowledge, they have the time and they still make mistakes very often. You need to be aware of your own capabilities and being overly confident can be great in the short term but will lose you money in the long term. Here comes the final lesson. Stick to broad index funds. Yeah, I know, it's boring, it's lazy, it's not gonna make you a millionaire overnight. This is exactly why I think it's an absolutely great idea. And they are the obvious pick for small retail investors like you and me. And here is why. First of all, they are diversified. We saw that First Republic Bank fell by 80% in the last 10 days, whereas the S&P Banking Index fell by 26%. Broad index funds like the Vanguard S&P 500 or the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund, they fell by how much? Somewhere between 2 and 4%. It was nothing. Second of all, you don't need to do any sort of due diligence because you are buying a massive basket of stocks. All you need to do is spread out your purchases and keep buying every week or two weeks or every month. Basically, just dollar cost average and be patient. There's apps that help you do this, like Nutmeg, which I personally use and you can check it out in the comments below. This is known as passive investing and it works amazing if you have a long investing time span. Anything over than 5, ideally 10 years. The best thing about passive investing is that it prevents prevents you from engaging in formal trades and it allows you to detach yourself a bit from the stock market. That is a big plus if you have a lot of money invested. Having $100,000 in a single company is a lot more stressful than having $100,000 in a broad index fund. The other great thing about passive investing in index funds is that they free up your time so that you can focus on improving yourself, improving your skills and earn more at your job, which is ultimately the best safety net that you can have as an individual. So what do you think? Were these less Lessons useful. Do you have any lessons yourself? Let me know in the comments below. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching and I will talk to you again soon.